Professor of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin and a holder of the Cullen Trust for Higher Education and of Professorship in Engineering. He received her Bachelor's in Biomedical Engineering and PhD in Macromolecular Science and Engineering from Case Western Reserve University under the guidance of Ann Hiltner and Jim Anderson. She then completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Tony Mikos' lab at Rice University with a focus on orthopedic tissue engineering. She joined the faculty of Biomedical Engineering at Texas A&M University in 2007, prior to moving to the University of Texas in Austin in 2017. Her laboratory specializes in the development of polymeric biomaterials to improve clinical outcomes of medical devices and regeneration strategies. She's a co-founder of Rytheo Medical on the scientific board of ECM Biosurgery and a consultant of many companies on biostability evaluation of medical devices. She previously served as an associate editor of the Journal of Biomedical Materials Research Part B and a chair of the NIH study section on muscles, musculoskeletal tissue engineering. The floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation to be here today. I'm excited to give one of the uh, Terasaki talks um, and tell you about some of our new technology in the lab um, in the cardiovascular. Before I get started, I just want to do our disclosures for the lab. So as was mentioned, I am a stakeholder in ECM Biosurgery, and we did a co-founder and stakeholder in Rydio Medical, which actually seeks to commercialize the technology I'll tell you about today. I'm also a paid consultant on biostability testing for a number of companies. So our lab here at UT Austin is really focused on designing and developing innovative polymeric biomaterials to, to improve clinical outcomes. So I'm a polymer engineer by training, and we use polymer engineering tools in a wide variety of different applications from cardiovascular, which I'll touch on today, to orthopedic, wound healing, and gynecological. And we really focus on how do we really design the material from the ground up, all the way from coming up with new materials that better interact with the body, to ways to control the architecture to get higher function out of those materials. Um, so our work in the orthopedic space is some of our longest lasting work all the way back from when I was a postdoc in Tony Nikos' lab, um, where we started working thinking about developing injectable bone foams, um, as well as doing 3D printing. Um, we've explored cell-releasing hydrogels, autograft extenders. Some of our more recent work is looking at engineered induced membranes. Uh, wound healing is a newer area of our lab where we're looking at creating uh, hydrogel foams uh, as first line dressings that can really improve healing outcomes for diabetic patients and other chronic wounds, um, both by controlling uh, moisture better as well as adding in bioactive factors, uh, but that would still retain that first line dressing as an off the shelf low cost dressing. Women's health is a newer area for us. We're doing this in collaboration with Julie Hakeem down at, in Houston, as well as Melissa Grunlin at Texas A&M, thinking about self-fitting vaginal stents. And we're kicking around the idea of exploring fetal membrane patches with Manuel Rausch here at UT. Um, but one of our biggest areas continues to be cardiovascular. We started in this area thinking about vascular graphs and how we design better vascular graphs. We're using a similar multi-layer approach, thinking about heart valves now, adding in model-directed design with Michael Sachs. Uh, we did some cardiac patchwork with Jeff Jaycott, who's now in Colorado. But today I'm going to be telling you about our work on injectable hydrogel electrodes. And really what's exciting about this technology was really developed by this partnership with a clinician. So we started working with Mehdi Razavi down at Texas Heart Institute, and he came to us with a, a a need from the clinic. So what he struggles with in, in helping patients in the clinic and, and partnering with him has been so rewarding to really part, take the engineering aspects and tools that we can have to solve this clinical problem. Um, and so this partnership with Medi Razavi is really the foundation for why we even got into this space because there's a newer area for us. And before I go into telling you about that technology, I really want to highlight the driving force behind it. So Dr. Gabriel Rodriguez Rivera was a very talented graduate student who graduated with his PhD last summer. He's currently doing a postdoc with Jason Burdick. And this was really his baby that I'll be telling you about today. And he's on the job market this year. So look out for him on the faculty uh, search circuit and then look for his independent lab coming in, in recent years. So the, the problem that Medi came to us with is ventricular arrhythmia. So sudden cardiac arrest is one of the leading causes of death. 
And this happens because the native conduction in your heart, which is responsible for the coordinated pumping of blood, gets disrupted whenever you have scarring. So this scarring can be genetic or, or happen from birth, but most often the case happens when you have a heart attack. Even if it's an undiagnosed heart attack, you have these regions of dead tissue in your heart, which actually disrupts the, the electrical signal. And so this can lead to ventricular arrhythmias and in severe cases, it can lead to ventricular fibrillation. That's where you, you lose all coordinated pumping. And this is why you can get um, sudden cardiac death is you lose coordinated pumping of the heart just by having this chaotic electrical signal. Uh, so there's a lot of treatments for this. And so the first thing, the easiest, the easiest thing they can do is they can do medication. However, this often it's toxic at high levels. It's also prorhythmic, which seems to be counterintuitive. Um, it tends to slow down the beating of the heart. It doesn't really address the, the underlying need. So it's actually often uh, ineffective in a lot of patients. Uh, catheter ablation and implantable cardiac defibrillators are the most successful in treatment treating people at risk for sudden cardiac death. Um, we have strong problems with catheter ablation in that you have 18 to 40% recurrent arrhythmias. So they'll have to repeat the procedure and each procedure has certain risks associated with it. And then the implantable cardiac defibrillator works, but it's doing that shock like you see in, on TV when they shock your heart. Uh, that's what it's doing. And so these patients walk around every day not knowing when this shock could occur. So there's a lot of post-traumatic stress associated with it, a lot of low quality of life associated with that as well. And so there's been a lot of efforts to improve cardiac rhythm management um, from anywhere from doing cardiac uh, carbon fibers to doing regenerative medicine approaches. Uh, but we really started thinking about what could we do with some of the materials that we developed? And so we came up with a conductive hydrogel platform to address two of these with the injectable hydroelectrode, which I'll tell you most, I'll mostly focus on today, but I'll also talk about how we're using a hydro, uh, conductive hydrogel to also improve ablation. And we think by doing this, we can really transform cardiac rhythm management. So the first one I'm gonna to talk to you about is how could we come up with an alternative to having implantable cardiac defibrillator? And again, the challenge here is not that it doesn't work, it works, uh, but it's a high energy shock that's very painful and really impacts quality of life. So if we think about why can't we just, this sounds like a pacing problem, like, right? So why can't we just use a pacemaker, which are, you know a lot of patients have, um, and why can't we just use that to restart the, the signal in the heart? And the challenge with that is that we have uh, pacemakers use this low energy stimuli and it's not enough to go from this chaotic electrical stimulus or storm that's going on in the heart during fibrillation to reset it. And the reason for that is that you have a very low energy stimulus that's pretty far away from the area that you have this chaotic, area, chaotic energy source, so chaotic conduction. So the chaotic conduction is basically think about it as a buoy in the ocean of scar. So it's a scar area and the wave signal is coming to it, it hits that buoy and it starts creating other alternate uh, waves that, that mess up the conduction. And so when we have this low point energy that we use for pacing, it's way up here at the top of the heart and the scar is way down here. And so the signal basically just gets delayed. And so that delay continues to happen. And when we use high energy shocks, we are actually capturing a large portion of the heart simultaneously. And that's able to just extinguish all these reentry currents and have a have a have reset it to have that single wave going through. And so if we think about it, then the problem is either we need to bring this energy back down here so that we are not so far away or we need a way to capture more of the tissue simultaneously. So if we could either get the stimulus closer to the star or increase capture area, then we could defibrillate at low energy. And if it were defibrillating at low energy, it wouldn't be painful and we, we would really improve patient outcomes. Now, the challenge for that is that again, pacemakers are threaded through these veins and, and anchored way up here at the top of the heart. And these arterial veins, um, go right where the scar is, but we can't navigate them. So the leads that we have are too big to get way down here into the mid myocardium where we need to be to either capture more of the tissue area 
or eliminate the reentry circuits around the, the heart. So we came up with the idea. So that's what Medi came to us with. And we came up with the idea of creating an injectable hydrogel electrode that would go in the same way you go in when you place a pacemaker lead, but we would inject this hydrogel and it would cure in this vein to transform it into a hydro electrode to get the electrical stimulus right to the same area of that scar area. And so now if we can increase capture across the scar, so we're bringing the signal to the scar area, and then we're also capturing more of the area because we get this planar wavefront from the entire length of the hydro electrode, then we think this is paves the way to do painless defibrillation at low energy. Now to be able to actually accomplish it, that was our idea when we first started talking to Medi. So then we translate that into uh, idea into a materials engineering design list. And so we needed something with an injectable that was injectable so that we could do, we didn't have to do open heart surgery. Um, so it had to be injectable with a rapid in-situ cure, conductive so that we could promote this fast uniform cell activation. It had to be able to maintain like it, the heart's beating. So we're talking about a fatigue environment. So it had to be mechanically stable. And then of course, biocompatible and biostable because we're talking about a long-term implant here. And so we quickly settled in on thinking about hydrogels for this um, and thinking about we're a synthetic lab. So we like our synthetic hydrogels best. Uh, so we, we started in on polyethylene glycol based hydrogels, again, just for its established chemical history and biocompatibility and its tunable nature. So we can do a lot with the chemistry very rapidly to be able to iterate to it, achieve our design criteria. And we knew that there are several, several people have demonstrated that it's safe as an injectable system as well. So one of the challenges though is the most common PEG-based hydrogel is PEG diacrylate. And we had already demonstrated that these undergo very slow hydrolysis due to this acrylate ester here. Uh, we had show, demonstrated this both with accelerated testing as well as an animal implants in a sub-Q rat study. And we had replaced these with acrylamide groups and shown that these were, uh, that these were biostable um, and that that was a strategy. But we wanted to uh, synthesize a new macromer uh, that would work for our system to both improve the biostability as well as the mechanical properties. And so we replaced again that acrylate ester from the PEG diacrylate uh, with this uh, polyether urethane diacrylamide group. So we have the urethanes for additional hydrogen bonding and the acrylamide groups here for in situ curing. And these two groups give us lots of hydrogen bonding sites um, to improve our, our fatigue resistance. And we demonstrated with accelerated testing here, if we do just do 37 degrees, uh, these higher molecular peg diacrylates actually degrade within a week. Um, and if we do higher temperatures, they degrade within a day. Whereas these polyethylurethane diacrylamides stay stable and accelerated testing for up to six months. Um, and we actually demonstrated this as well um, in an, a sub-Q study as well, looking at modulus. Um, and so, one of the things that we were again going to show just to make sure that that accelerated testing corresponded to their in vivo results. And so we did an in vivo sub-Q study and again showed that we weren't seeing changes in swelling or modules, indicating that these are relatively biostable. Um, and again, the reason we chose PEG as a backbone for our system was as highly tunable and, and, and could be tuned to the, the tissue mechanics of the myocardium. So we're looking at something that can be very similar to the, to the cardiac tissue so that we're not inducing a host response because it's too stiff. Um, and so we were able to tune the mechanical properties just by changing concentration and molecular weight, um, looking at targets of moduli and stretch ratios similar to the myocardium. Uh, and we were able to do that with these uh, biostable PEG polyethylurethane diacrylamide systems. Again, I mentioned before that we added in these uh, acrylamide and, and urethane groups to show for this enhanced hydrogen bonding. Uh, we also added in a small molecule crosslinker, uh, N-acetyl uh, glycinamide. Here you'll see this, is, this just looks like, um, this has the same um, acrylamide groups as well as the having this uh, additional hydrogen bonding groups. So we add this in to facilitate crosslinking and additional hydrogen bonding and demonstrate that this has really nice mechanical properties in terms of stretch and, and suture damage resistance. And again, tuning the mechanical properties with concentration and molecular weight, we ended up with 
looking at about a 20 kilodalton molecular weight of the macromer with 20% and 1% of this crosslinker gave us uh, very similar results, uh, it's very similar stiffnesses uh, to our myocardium. So again, within this range. And we're currently looking at this um, in terms of fatigue testing, uh, looking at how this performs in just simple uniaxial fatigue. We've seen uh, good results so far. And we're working with Manuel Rausch here at UT Austin to do more advanced um, mechanical testing and long-term accelerated fatigue testing to, to uh, be able to mimic and say, could we predict, does this predict that it will last for the lifetime of the patient? So we're currently looking at 400 million cycles for 10 years as an estimate. Uh, this is actually pretty challenging to develop as a lab type test with a hydrogel, um, but we have a really great partnership to get this done. So these polyethylurethane diacrylamide hydrogels, um, again, satisfied our ideas for being able to have this transvenous delivery injectable, matching tissue stiffness, biostable fatigue resistance. So then we had to think about how are we gonna actually get these to rapidly cure after delivery? And then how do we uh, introduce conductivity? So lots of options in terms of making an in-situ curing hydrogel. Um, a lot of the work in the literature looks at things like guest host interactions, or um, strain, uh, strain stiffening or different other aspects. But we really wanted something that was gonna be long-term biostable. So we really wanted something that would be a chemical cross-linking that happened in vivo. And so we, we looked at uh, thinking about how do we induce cross-linking when we don't wanna to have to have an external stimuli like UV. So we didn't wanna do any kind of thinking about how to do a photo curing when we're injecting into a vein when we want closed uh, systems. And so we looked at redox hydrels, so the idea of having a two component system. You have a reducing agent in one half of the solution and a, an initiator in the other half. And the, when they mix, that's when you generate your radicals. Uh, we did this with iron gluconate, which has been used clinically actually with hydrogels um, and ammonium persulfate. And looking again at having these be delivered with a dual lumen catheter. And then upon injection into the vein, they mix and cure. Um, and so we had demonstrated previously that this redox initiation is highly tunable um, by changing either the concentration of the initiator pair or the ratio of the initiators uh, to the reducing agent. So you have two axes to modulate the cure. Uh, we can make them cure faster than we can measure them. Um, and we can have a pretty broad range that is still cytocompatible for this system. And so this is what this looks like. For our initial studies, we took our, again, our macromer with our crosslinker. We added the ammonium persulfate in one side of a double barrel syringe and the iron gluconate in the other side of the barrel, uh, uh, of the double barrel syringe. And then it goes through this mixing head and that initiates radical crosslink of our hydrogel and results in this nice in situ curing hydrogel. And so we did a lot of uh, investigation of how to tune the, the gel uh, curing kinetics, um, looking at changing ammonium persulfate, what was the effect if we looked at different molecular weights of the PUDAM, different, different concentrations of our crosslinker. We're injecting into a vein, so what are we thinking about? What's the effect of blood? And from all this, we had a target of curing in less than two minutes. Um, and so we identified what was the initiator concentration and ammonium and reducing agent concentration that gave us this two minutes. Um, and again, it's very tunable. Now we started thinking about, so we had a two minute cure time on a real, uh, you know, on a rheometer. So we are like, okay, what does this actually mean in terms of uh, gel retention when we inject it into the heart? We didn't wanna go straight to an animal. Uh, so we started doing some benchtop ex vivo studies with, with hearts. And initially when we first started looking at it, the hydro was gone and we we're like, what, what happened? Like what, what was going on? And so what was happening is that when we inject it into the heart, if it cured too slowly, then, then the hydrogel precursor solution would actually drain into the tributaries of the vein before it ended up curing. So we had this balancing act that it had to be injectable, it had to cure fast enough to be retained in the vein before it drained into the tributaries. And this is even this is before we're even talking about the heart pumping. Um, and so we did a lot of I did a, additional iterative testing, understanding looking at what are the main drivers for gel retention. And it was twofold. It wasn't just the curate, it was also the viscosity. So when it was a low viscosity solution, you would get rapid tributary drainage 
Um, and then you could get better retention if you increase the cure rate. But in fact, what we needed to do was increase both viscosity and cure rate to get a good gel retention. So if we had high viscosity with fast kinetics, uh, then we would get good gel retention. Um, and we did some modeling because we thought, well, now we're increasing our viscosity. That's going to change our mixing. Our initiator system is dependent on mixing of the two hydrogel solutions. So we, this became a very complex problem really quickly that was limited by doing just iterative testing. And so we started doing some modeling, thinking about if we looked at different viscosities, how would that affect uh, different um, mixing of the hydrogel solutions? We wanna make sure we got good uniform mixing as it comes out of the mixing head so that we would get uniform hydrogel uh, formation. And again, just looking at how, how that was affected. So what we found is balancing this macromere viscosity and cure rates was necessary and that we would have to, we had to con make considerations in terms of the mixing head design to make sure that at the appropriate viscosity, we had good mixing to get uniform uh, behavior. So we made sure that once it was injected through and, and uh, retained in these veins, that we actually got good gel formation all along the entire length. So we actually, we did a number of studies, um, both in just standard tubing, um, tubing with blood, and then in the ex vivo heart to look at what was the hydrogel like, both in terms of swelling and gel fraction along its length. And we were able to demonstrate once we balanced these appropriately and had good mixing, we got nice homogeneity across the hydrogel, indicating that we had good cure and would likely get good retention. We wanted to make sure that, that we weren't then, now that we had something that worked, so we knew what concentrations we were using, making sure that we weren't getting a cytotoxicity. Again, I said we were building on the clinical uh, history of PEG-based hydrogels, but we're introducing a lot of other factors, soluble factors that could leach out like the, that ammonium persulfate or the iron gluconate. Um, so we want to make sure none of these extractables were, were dangerous or cytotoxic in any way. Uh, we did basic... Uh, contact studies with uh, human umbilical vein endothelial cells, as well as IPS-derived cardiomyocytes. This was done in collaboration with Nicket and Janet Zolden's lab here at, at UT Austin, who helped us with these IPS-derived cardiomyocytes. And we saw good cytocompatibility across all of these. Um, cytocompatibility studies on the bench only take you so far, so we did do subcutaneous rat studies. Uh, just looking at the, the host response in comparison to silicone. We stand, saw a pretty standard host response uh, with a thin fibrous capsule after four weeks, very similar to this medical grade, which indicates a good biocompatibility. So we felt like we had gotten an injectable hydrogel uh, system that was biostable and, and had good gel formation, gel retention in, vivo, in our ex vivo study. Um, but again, this is not an electrode yet. And so we had to then incorporate uh, conductivity into the design. So again, when we're talking about conductive hydrogels, lots of options. And we try, I feel like we tried all of the options before we settled. Um, the first things we tried was uh, what a lot of people do, which is adding electroconductive polymers or fillers. Uh, so we started with gold nanoparticles. Well, we actually started with silver nanoparticles. Then because of corrosion, we went up to gold nanoparticles thinking about gold nanorods. And the challenge we ran, up, ran into again and again with the system of doing fillers to add in conductivity, especially electronic conductivity, is you have to hit that percolation threshold to get good conductivity, which means you're adding in a ton of this filler to get that percolation threshold, and that would destroy our injectability. So it, being able to deliver this via catheter when we had that much nanoparticle in it became really difficult. Um, the postdoc that I had at the time, uh, Gosho Twako, uh, super, super talented. Almost, we almost stumbled on this idea of doing ionic-based conduction instead. And this is just a beautiful, elegant, uh, simple solution to this issue. And so the idea being like, if we just add in salts to the hydrogel solution, soluble, we're doing mostly water. So adding in salts, we can do a lot of ions in there. Um, it's really easy, biocompatible, and doesn't affect our injectability, doesn't affect any of our other criterion. So we started looking at this ionic, uh, these ionic hydrogels by simply adding in salts to the hydrogel during formation. And we demonstrated that these actually gave us really nice conductivity. Just if we stayed at 
the salt concentration of e extracellular fluid, so just standard saline levels, we are actually three times the, the conductivity of the native myocardium. And we also demonstrate, we did a, an in vivo study. Well, it's ionic, the ions can go out, but actually it equilibrates with this extracellular ion fluid. So if you put a water gel in, in a rat, it actually becomes ionic conducting hydrogel. Um, and so our ionic hydrogel, if you start with ionic hydrogel, it stabilizes to the extracellular ion fluid um, and remains conductive. And we did this out to a month. So we did a lot of testing just as in terms of it being used with standard pacing modalities and showed that we could get really stable um, pacing signals from this. Uh, and we looked at, as you would expect, you do see a, a reduction in current uh, along the length of the hydrogel, but it still maintains a pretty high current uh, for the length that we're looking at. And so from this, we had, we had met all of our design criteria, and, and so we were, we were like, okay, we're ready. Let's actually try this in a beating heart and see if we can actually conduct and pace using this hydrogel electrode. Uh, so if anyone's squeamish, there are gonna be some pretty, um, there's gonna be some open heart images and, and, and videos coming up. So if you may need to look away or, or, or minimize it and just listen. Um, we started doing these studies again at Texas Heart Institute. They have an amazing animal facility uh, core there uh, working with Mehdi Razavi. And so we wanted to do, we, we did this and we're just looking to see, will it cure in a beating heart? And we, it is amazing because this has happened very few times in my career that the first time we tried something actually worked. Uh, so this is, we added contrast so you can just see it filling the, the AIV as well as the tributaries going well, really far deep into the mid myocardium. So remember up here is where we are previously limited to pacing stimuli. We're getting all the way down into the mid myocardium with this injectable hydrogel electrode. This is actually showing the hydrogel cured in this vein in a beating heart, no problems. We're able to deliver it and have good retention. And you can see some of these tributary uh, cure systems. And most of this breakage is from us pulling it out, not because it was broken um, in the vein. Um, so we did the same studies here, making sure we injected into two different veins, the AIB as well as the MCB, uh, which, which transverse the heart in two different ways. So it shows that it's not dependent on which vein you use. And we showed, again, we looked at hydrogel homogeneity. So as we inject it into the heart, do we get good uniform cure along the, the length? And we did. Uh, so we're very excited to see that. Um, and then we did, this is one of the questions I always get. So you may be thinking in the back of your head, the first time I talk about this, like this woman is crazy. Like she is injecting into the heart. She's going to cause a heart attack. She's going to cause ischemia. She's, it's going to be horrible for the heart. But I want to reemphasize re-emphasize that we are injecting in veins, not in heart, not into arteries. And so in the veins, commonly in the clinic, when they place pacemaker leads as well as others, they, they occlude these veins commonly without any, any adverse clinical outcomes. Uh, but we get this question a lot. And honestly, no one's ever tried this before. So we are looking at this in terms of a safety perspective. Uh, so the most thing that you would think about in general is our sub-Q study said it, the hydro itself is pretty bi is biocompatible, seems to be biocompatible without any leachables for toxicity. Similarly, when we actually inject it in the heart, we, we don't see any necrosis or anything indicating that we're getting any negative material compatibility aspect. We do see some fibrosis, mostly in the areas when we basically overfill the vein. So if you overfill the vein, you get a response because you both basically burst up burst the vein and you have some response to that. So there's going to be some, some work up in, in figuring out how to better control the injection to not overfill the vein. Um, but long term, we did four week just proof of principle study and we looked at cardiac function. So we looked at cardiac enzymes, which would tell us if we had ischemia, we're not seeing any indication of that. And we looked at function in terms of ejection fraction, again, not seeing any change. So it looks pretty promising from that perspective. Um, but again, in terms of this, we did this as an open heart where we're just injecting into the vein. Uh, as I said, what we eventually want to do for this is inject through a dual lumen catheter. There are dual lumen catheters on the market right now, but we just need to modify them to have this uh, mixing head and a balloon uh, to prevent the hydrogel from back, like going back uh, on the venous return side and staying 
um, in the heart. So we are designing that currently. We have some prototypes uh, uh, already in place that we're testing with benchtop models. Okay. So I've showed you that it works. It doesn't seem to hurt the heart, but does it act? I showed you that we can inject it. It can cure. It fills down to the mid myocardium, but does it work? And so what we we then were able to demonstrate is as we're as this is normal pacing. This is normal sinus without any pacing. It's beating. Um, and then once we start again, we're going to pace through the hydroelectrode, and you see it start beating faster. Um, so the first time we tried this, it we got good gel retention in the hydrogel, and we were able to pace the heart in the hydrogel. But what was really exciting, especially especially to my electrophysiologist partners, he looked at the EKG, and he 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 showed it to me, and he was like, "Boom, there it is." He's like, "This is transformative," and I was like. Um, I'm a material scientist. You're going to need to walk me through this. Um, so I'm going to walk you through it the way he walked me through it. So this is a, a native sinus uh, EKG, right? You get the PQRST curves, right? Uh, when we do standard hydroelectro, do you see how this, this peak is inverted? It's inverted because you're when you do native sinus, it goes through these Purkinje fibers and you're actually are stimulating from the bottom of the heart. And that's why you get that coordinated squeezing and pumping out of the heart. With the metal electrode, you, you're reversing the signal. You're actually having the signal go from the top down slower through that system. Our hydroelectrode, again, because we're able to get down here, kind of similar to these Purkinje fibers, we're actually able to not have this inversion. So we actually get what we think is that we're capturing these deep septal bundle branches, branches and these Purkinje fibers. So we're actually, for the first time, mimicking native conduction with external pacing. Uh, so he was he was so excited. He's he's still floored about this, and this is what prompted us to start looking at transforming this into or translating this um, with our radio medical. But one of the other things, so one of the things I told you we needed to be able to do to get painless defibrillation at low energy was bring the signal to the area of the heart where the scar was. And so I just showed you that we could do that. The next thing we need to do is capture more of the tissue area so that we can minimize the effect of tissue heterogeneity when you have scar. And so what I'm showing you here, these are electro, um, these are electro, these are mapping of the electrical stimulus in the heart. Um, and I'm showing you what it looks like is, is when it's blue and purple, that's late, late uh, translation of the signal. When it's early, you get early capture of the signal. So we have this uh, electro mapping that we're getting and the, these heat maps are gonna be, again, if it's red, that means you get early capture. And when it's blue, that's later transmission of that signal. And so when we first look at the point pacing versus our hydroelectrode, we see these large areas where it's orange and red which basically means we're capturing early much more of the tissue. And with the idea that increased area of early activation supports that we're getting, we're getting capture all along the length of the hydroelectrode, and that should minimize tissue heterogeneity. And again, that is the underlying cause of this, of uh, ventricular arrhythmias. So that's all well and good in theory. To actually do this in, to do a full proof of concept, we actually have to generate a myocardial infarct model, and then show that it increases arrhythmias, and then show that the hydroelectrode can prevent that. We're doing that. We just got an NIH grant to do that study, but that takes a really long time. And we wanted to do uh, some way to show that this hydroelectrode could minimize the effect of tissue heterogeneity. And so we decided to do that using a pretty standard method in electrophysiology, which is using ablation model. So we go in and we kill parts of the heart. So it's not scar, but it is non-conductive parts of the heart. And so we wanted to generate areas of delayed conduction. And we're doing that with this ablation lesion. And we first demonstrated, again, these electro, these electro mapping, looking at when it's orange, again, this is orange to yellow to green, means later and later and later, okay? So before ablation, you see a lot of orange and yellow. After ablation, you see a lot more green. That means we're getting this delayed conduction because of that ablation. This is with point pacing. Now look what happens when we do the same ablation lesion, but we pace with a hydrogel electrode. Here, all red, 
red is early activation. So when we, again, when we did the ablation, we caused delayed conduction. And we, when we did the hydroelectrode in that ablation lesion, we don't see the effect. In fact, we see faster activation throughout this whole thing. And so what we're doing with this hydroelectrode is exactly what we said would happen, which is when we can capture across, along the entire length of the hydrogel, we can minimize any effect of tissue heterogeneity that causes reentry and causes ventricular arrhythmia. So as a proof of concept, this was, this was a game changer for us. Uh, so we were able to develop the material aspects for this um, to create an injectable hydroelectrode. And very excitingly, we demonstrated that we could deliver it and it would cure, and that having a hydroelectrode that can go all the way down into the mid myocardium really was able to capture those Purkinje fibers, fibers to get native conduction. And we also demonstrated that with the planar wavefront propagation, we could minimize tissue heterogeneity. So this really has the potential to transform how we do cardiac rhythm uh, management. So we are continuing to work on this to do longer, uh, longer studies to demonstrate safety, but also do this study to actually show that it, it prevents ventricular arrhythmias, as well as able to provide uh, low energy painless defibrillation. So that's our work on, on coming up with painless defibrillation. But we had done all this work on developing this beautiful conductive hydro, and we wanted to see what else we could do with it. And so we started thinking about catheter ablation. Catheter ablation is the most common procedure when someone is at risk for sudden cardiac death, um, but again, 40% recurrent rate. And so what we did was we started thinking about how a conductive hydro might affect this system. So the way that, that radio frequency ablation works is you have this electric energy that is being that is applied at the at the tissue interface in the area where you have chaotic electric signals, right? So you have an area where signal comes in and it kind of gets wonky. <laughs> That's a technical term, wonky signal. Um, and so what we're trying to do is we basically want to kill that area so that the electrical signal can just bypass this without without getting disrupted. And so the electrical energy comes in and it gets transmitted into the tissue because the tissue is conductive, um, but it's not a great conductor. And so a lot of this causes resistive heating at this interface. And this works, once you get above 50 degrees C, you'll start killing the tissue. And that's fine and it works and you, you kill the tissue, but the challenge is that you have this metal tip on this irregular shaped structure of the heart and so everywhere it's touching, you can get good tissue coupling, but anywhere it's not touching, you get this, this um, area of an of increased impedance because a lot of the, the blood and, and other aspects um, in, get in the way. And so what ends up happening is you have to use more power to get into the tissue further, but you have uneven heating because you have uneven tissue coupling or uneven tissue contact. And so what ends up happening, you start having this cavitation. And this is not good because this, this causes microemboli, which is problematic. But you're also causing damage. And in the thinner areas like atrial fibrillation where this is used, which has thinner areas, if you perforate, you can, you can lead to fatal consequences. Uh, the other challenge in this is that it's really hard to tell when you've ablated the tissue well enough. Um, so why am I telling you about this? One of the things we found out is if we can instead have our hydrogel, have our metal, our stiff metal probe coated with the hydrogel, the hydrogel creates a beautiful interface with the tissue. So we're increasing tissue contact. So we get more even transmission of the radio frequency energy. And so we get much more homogeneous lesions uh, without this pitting and cavitation, which is very, so problematic. Um, but to be able to do this, we had to expand our, our aspect, our control of the hydrogel conductivity, and we wanted more than just one uh, hydrogel conductivity. And so we went from just not only looking at ionic concentration, but actually adding in electrolyte monomers uh, to the backbone. We we're looking at anionic monomers here, adding it into the backbone and looking at different effects, either adding it as a co-monomer. Um, so it on its own is very brittle, so it doesn't work very well. Um, if we added in it as a copolymer, 
So adding it to kinetic chain length. And then we also looked at IPN aspects uh, to drive this. And so we did a lot of structure property relationships. Um, I don't have time to go into a lot of them today, but functionally what we found as expected is when you're just running these, your salt concentration depends, uh, dictates a lot of your conductivity. Um, but water content also changes your conductivity pretty heavily. Um, and then when you're designing these, again, with our, uh, with the, the uh, polyelectrite hydrils are very brittle, but we can actually get pretty nice uh, properties either by incorporating as a copolymer or, uh, sorry, as a copolymer or as an IPN. And that, by having an IPN, we can actually balance water content and mechanics. We can decouple those so that we can balance the properties to get a good coating. So we're exploring this. This is our new area thinking about, okay, if we're doing, if we're designing a coating, how do all of these things affect, affect it? How stiff the hydrogel is, what the, what the conductivity of the hydrogel is, um, how does that affect tissue coupling and how does that then affect lesion homogeneity and durability? Uh, so we're doing this in collaboration again with the Texas Heart Institute and Medi Rizavi's team there. But one of the challenges when I first was, was looking at this was how do we know we have a good lesion, especially like as the, as the surgeon is doing this? And I'll tell you right now, there aren't a lot of good options, which is part of the reason why we have a 40% recurrency rate. Um, and I went to WPI and did a seminar there on, on the ablation technology, sorry, on the hydroelectro technology. And I met Kai Zong there. And he was already working on using a photoacoustic uh, method to do ablation lesion <laughs> intravital monitoring. And so we're working with him on a prototype where we actually have a hydrogel coated ablation monitor, sorry, ablation probe that has this integrated photoacoustic monitoring so that as we're delivering the, the RF energy, we're actually able to correlate and see how, I apologize for the, the resolution of these images, where we're able to see how does, how does it correspond, how does the photoacoustic spectral fingerprint correspond to ablation lesion and therefore long-term durability of that lesion to, permit, to, to prevent uh, ventricular arrhythmias. Uh, so we're really excited to work with him on this um, and really looking at how to do these studies long-term once we get that integrated probe and correspond correlating that to clinical workflow. Um, to be honest, I think this project has a faster time to the clinic just because it's not an implantable device. It's a temporary device um, and it works really well with the standard ablation technology that's used clinically. But regardless, the combination of these two approaches really has the option of opportunity to really transform cardiac rhythm management um, in the clinic for a wide in wide range of patients with different indications. So we're really excited about that. Um, I wanna again, thank our partners in crime uh, over at Texas Heart Institute, as well as the WPI. Uh, working with Medi and Kai has been just a, a pleasure as well as Matthews, uh, Drew and Allison. And of course my students and our funding from NIH and the McDonald Research Fund and, and UT BPR's office. I did wanna highlight if you do work kind of like this in terms of developing new material chemistry for biomedical applications, I'm an associate editor of J JMCB and Materials Advances and we'd love to see your work uh, there. RSC is a great journal, uh, a great uh, publisher to work with um, and we have a pretty fast turnaround time. Um, and then I also wanna highlight for all of those in the tissue engineering space that we do have the World Congress coming up in June of next year. It's gonna be in Seattle this year. Nasima Nabi and I are co-chairing this, uh, this session. Nasima's at UCLA, so just down the street from y'all. Um, this is gonna be a really great conference where we've almost finalized our plenaries and we have an amazing program planned out. So definitely put that on your calendar. And our abstracts are currently open and due January 15th, so take a look. We'd love to see your work there as well. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk, uh, Professor Hernandez. Uh, so a couple of questions came in. One is, I'm a polymer chemist. I'm curious to know the cross-linking mechanism and the reaction condition. Yeah, so this is standard radical cross-linking. Um, so the uh, iron gluconate is causing the decomposition of the ammonium persulfate, and then that is uh, that radical cross-linking is, is initiating the acrylamide in groups of the polyether urethane diacrylamide. Um, and so this is all, these were all done 
at, um, we we started at room temperature, but then did all the cross-linking and kinetics at 37 to mimic in vivo conditions. Thank you. Can the hydrogel electrodes be used for long-term monitoring or stimulation of physiological signals? What considerations need to be taken into account for extended use? Yeah, so our plan is to do long-term stimuli. So the things that we're considering are, what's the stability of the conductivity? And as far as we can tell, I, the ionic conductivity should be stable because it just stabilizes uh, with the extracellular fluid ion concentration. Um, now, if we wanted to go beyond what standard saline concentrations are, that's why we started looking at the electrolyte um, comonomers because that shifts the equilibrium um, with, with extracellular fluid ions uh, to be greater. So I think we can use that. We're still exploring that as a function. So that's for stimuli. The other aspect for long-term stimuli would be that you would have to have continuity of the hydro, which is why we're looking at fatigue testing. If it breaks, what happens? Now, I think that it actually is pretty, it's not very sensitive to small breaks because you still have extracellular fluid that kind of mitigates that. Um, so we actually don't think that it's gonna be that sensitive. <coughs> Excuse me. But we're still looking at that. Now, measurements, like getting readings out of it, we're, we're not in that space, so I can't speak to that. And it, it hasn't been, uh, we haven't looked at any of those kind of opportunities. Uh, I know that would be a, a strong consideration if we we're thinking about neuro applications, having signaling and readouts. Thank you. There's a question regarding the conductive uh, conduction mechanism. Given that the conductive hydrogel is, is hydrophilic and it has a high likelihood of swelling, which could later, which could alter its structure and conductive pathways during application, how do you optimize the applied electric field or control the conductivity of the hydrogel? Yeah, it's a great question. So water content in a hydrogel definitely affects ionic conductivity. And I, I didn't go through it. I, I kind of skipped over a lot of that site. We did a, a fair amount of work looking at the effect of um, what is the polymer background, backbone versus swelling versus um, different things. And that was really important when we we're trying to add in that ionic comonomer. Um, for these systems right now, the it, it's we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Right now, we have a system that it's constrained swelling because it only fills the vein, right? So what happens as that vein wall remodels? Like, is there space for it to continue to swell? Does it push out? Like what, what happens? Um, so that is something that we're, we're definitely looking at. Um, there, are de there are chemistry opportunities for us to constrain the swelling of the hydrogel while maintaining the injectability and the mechanics. Um, and that's something that we are looking at. We get have a lot of opportunities that for that with the IPN where we can decouple some of these a little bit more, uh, but it's a great question. Uh, one final question is, how would you later remove the polymer electrodes if needed? Oh yeah, we get this question a lot. So right now we're not planning on removing them. So the idea is that these are permanent implants. Um, we've thought about, is there a way that we could design it so that we could do a trigger degradation? Possibly. Um, I, I don't know that it, it would be necessary. I, I think it would put the patient at risk. So right now we're considering these as, as permanent implants. So then your question is, well, what do you, what do you have to do if you need to do a replacement? Um, so there are different veins. And so what ends up happening when you occlude a vein in the heart, you get a lot of uh, collateral vein, venous return that ends up just remodeling and, and fixing itself and it ends up being fine. So we think that you, you at least could have two options. Um, the AIV is, is honestly the better option in terms of where typical scarring is, but the MCV is another option as well. Thank you. Is it possible in long term the gel becomes depleted with the ions? I don't think so, because I think it always normalizes to the extracellular ion fluid and you will always have extracellular ions. Um, but that, that's one of the things. And that's what we when we first looked at those sub Q studies, um, it was pretty it happens. Pretty, that equilibration happens very relatively quickly. I don't know how quickly but we did one week and it was already it was already equilibrated. If you put in a water hydrogel, so no ions, non-conductive relatively. And within a week, it had extracellular ions had 
had diffused in and it was now conductive. Um, so I don't know what the timing of that equilibrium, I can tell you it's less than a week, but um, I don't think, I think it will be stable. I don't think there's any time that you wouldn't get ion diffusion and replacement in, in your hydrogel. Thank you. What is the degradation rate of the hydrogel? How long will it stay at the site? Uh, this is, so our initial studies, when we did these studies, we did accelerated degradation testing. Um, those testings we took out to six months. And if I was going to predict how long it mm -hmm. took, like what the acceleration factor to in vivo, I would say it's at least 10, a tenfold. And so we're looking at, at that being a prediction of at least five years with no change. Now, that being said, um, the, so we would need to do additional testing and confirm that. That being said, we have had some issues with um, synthetic batch variability that we're trying to chase down currently. Um, but I think from a structural perspective, the base chemistry, as long as we get um, consistency in that structure, will be very stable for long term. So we're talking about decades. Thank you. Uh, very good presentation. Except for this amazing injectable gel electrode, may you provide more information about the system integration. How is the long-term stability inside the tissue, including biofouling, interfering with the complex tissue environment, et cetera? Yeah, so, um, so we're, we're, what we're doing is we're transforming a vein into an electrode. And so what the body does to that vein long-term, like what the remodeling is, we don't know. And we're looking in, like we're, we're doing those studies now. So what I think is, I think either, like likely the endothelial cells will go away. I think all of that will go away and it will just be a typical fibrous capsule formation there. Maybe we have to see what, what happens. I think as long as we keep it as the least irritating as possible, our host response will be reasonable um, for it being tolerated well into that system. And then it needs to be able to withstand the beating of the heart um, so that it doesn't fracture. Um, I don't think we're concerned about biofouling or anything along those lines because there's no blood flow in these veins after we occlude them with this hydrogel. It's really just what happens to the vein, just how does the body remodel an occluded vein? Um, and that's something that we're, I don't know that we know that. Um, I don't think, I don't know what, what people have seen in that. I don't know if anyone's really characterized that. So, so we're doing new areas for that. Thank you. Do the veins need to be completely filled with the hydrogel in order to make it fully functional? I don't think it needs to be fully occluded to be functional as long as you have a continuous path. I think we want it to be fully occluded just so that we don't have, we don't have to worry about areas where blood flow is slower and then you get thrown by. Like, I think we just want to completely occlude this. In fact, um, we've looked at, so we're, we're going to inject this. When we inject it, the catheter has a balloon that, that makes sure that there's no hydrogel going back to the venous return side. Um, and I think when we add in the, and then we would take that, that catheter out and then we would thread in the pacemaker lead and screw that pacemaker lead into the hydrogel. Um, and I think what we're currently looking at is when we do that, that we have a balloon that just ensures that it's fully occluded and we don't get any possible um, areas of problem at the, there. Thank you. Since it is an injectable conductive hydrogel, how about the gel against the vein wall shear stress? Also injection time was within two minutes. Does it cause high shear stress due to injection force, which may affect endothelial lining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's, this is what we saw. So like when we're doing it, when we've done all these pilot studies, we're, we're literally just have a syringe that we're just pushing. It's very uncontrolled. Um, and so what we saw was if we overfill the vein, the vein bursts. I'm not worried about shear stress because again, I'm not worried about what those endothelial cells really do after. I don't need to maintain the endothelial lining because again, no blood flow after, I'm not concerned about that. Um, but what I am concerned about is basically breaking open the vein because that stimulates fibrosis and we wanna avoid that. So we're trying to figure out what is a controlled way that we have some kind of back pressure fill 
so that we know like if we're as long as we're below this back pressure then our filling rate will be such that we don't overfill the veins except does that make sense um and so in terms of the cure time we did we did two minutes as our original cure time it's it's very highly adjustable and it will be and that's important because maybe for some of this these fill aspects we need to adjust our viscosity and so all of those things are interconnected and being able to change those uh, currently our formulation was designed so that we could got good gel retention and homogeneity um, and as far as that's concerned like that's working for us so far um, but again highly highly tunable system very easy to adjust as needed well, thank you for the talk. This all the questions I have. I appreciate, uh, appreciate your time. Okay, thank you all. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, my website, we have a, a lab tour, virtual lab tour here, and you can reach me either on Twitter on, or by email. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>